Hi guys, welcome to my analysis of To Look At Two, a poem by Robert Frost. I'm really excited to analyse this poem for you guys today because I really, really like it. I remember when I first read it, I read the last line and my immediate reaction was, oh, that's so cute. So to jump right into the introduction, um, some words to describe it might be that it's heartwarming, it's well-rounded, it's satisfying, optimistic and pleasant. And I think it achieves this by building to a climax and then delivering on that climax, which is quite unusual for Frost, who is usually very pessimistic and anticlimactic. So this is quite an unusual Frost poem in a lot of ways. Usually it is a lot darker than this. However, one of the ways this poem ties in with a lot of Frost's other work is that it uses natural occurrences as metaphors for human experiences. This is one of the most explicit examples of that, in fact, with the characters receiving a message from nature about how to live their lives and actually being aware of that and being grateful for it. So thus, again, I think this ties into the whole idea of this being a very satisfying poem and a very cute poem, even on the first reading when you might not understand it entirely. So this poem covers topics of balance, modesty and being humble, being in harmony with nature, love and also boundaries. So I think the optimistic nature of the poem is ultimately explained by this being a poem about boundaries. Unlike the characters in Frost's other poems on this subject, such as There Are Roughly Zones and Mending Wall, these characters stay within their boundaries and thus they have a happy ending. They find comfort and satisfaction in glimpsing what's out of their comfort zone without having to see any further beyond that. And we're going to explore this theme of boundaries and why the characters act in this way and what purpose it serves for the message of the poem later on in the video. Alright, so let's give you a quick summary of what happens in the poem. There's a couple in love who are walking up a mountain path. The path is rough and night is closing in and they think about turning back. They don't, however, until they reach a wall, and they look beyond it to the lonely and mystical path beyond. They sigh disappointedly, knowing that they can't go on. The path beyond is too untamable and hard to navigate. But then a doe and then a buck appear, that's a female and male deer, and they seem confused but unafraid of the couple, thinking them inanimate objects. So this humbles the couple, who realise that they may be the most important thing from their perspective, but on the other side, they are just another thing to observe, as the deer are to them. So we're sort of looking at the human perspective versus the perspective of the rest of nature. And by seeing that their perspective is basically the same as the mirrored one on the other side of the wall, they feel in harmony with nature and like their love has been reciprocated because the doe and the buck are, yeah, sort of a parallel for the female and male of the couple, showing that their love is universal and it's copied in nature and it's all nice. So that was a pretty terrible summary, wasn't it? But I just wanted to introduce you to my interpretation of the poem and sort of the angle we're going to be taking in this video and yeah just introduce you to some of the ideas we're going to be covering. I will be covering at the end of the video um, an alternate interpretation but let's go on that for now. Now we're going to jump into a line by line analysis. Love and forgetting might have carried them a little further up the mountainside with night so near but not much further up. They must have halted soon in any case with thoughts of a path back, how rough it was with rock and washout, and unsafe in darkness, when they were halted by a tumbled wall with barbed wire binding. Love and forgetting gives a sense of self-absorption and absorption in love, which tells us that this is a romantic stroll. This theme of self-absorption versus mindfulness when out of in nature is explored in other Robert Frost poems, An Encounter, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, and The Woodpile, if you guys are interested in uh, more about this subject. But in this poem, it seems that the love can only get them so far. They can't get much further up the mountain, as night is incoming, which is a force they can't fight. The mountain around them seems dangerous enough to eclipse the light of their love. So the night coming in, might be a metaphor for the darkness coming and the danger and all that sort of stuff. 
So there's a sense of danger and unease, which is signified by the harsh consonants and alliteration in lines five to eight. So to quickly give a word to possible interpretations of the poem as a whole, some people think this poem is about a couple that's about to break up um, and are persuaded not to by this encounter. And thus, this danger that we see in these lines represents problems in their relationship. However, I think that the danger is oncoming and it will, no, it will only get to them if they continue on this path beyond the wall. So it's sort of the story of how they were persuaded not to go into that dangerous territory, um, both metaphorically and literally. So interpret this how you want, but this is in any case quite a key part of the message. They stood facing this, spending what onward impulse they still had in one last look the way they must not go, on up the falling path where, if a stone or earth slide moved at night, it moved itself, no footstep moved it. This is all, they sighed, Good night to Woods. But not so. There was more. So here we see the couples come to a stop because of the wall. They have an onward impulse, but they are satisfied by just looking. They accept that they must not go. They see that this land beyond the wall is beyond human reach. Beyond the wall, there is nothing that is moved by humans. Instead, it moves itself. So there's this sense of nature being untamed and magical and sort of inaccessible by the human imagination. It's worth noting here though that though the couples stop, they seem disappointed that this is the end of their journey. They sigh and there's brief monosyllables to show their contempt. Then we have the first bit of dialogue in the poem which is always a striking moment and this dialogue is then answered and contradicted by the narration and this is one of my favorite things about this poem. I think it's such an awesome narrative tool to have the characters speak in dialogue and then the narrative gives them an answer and we will see this a couple more times as the poem goes on. A doe from round a spruce stood looking at them, across the wall as near the wall as they. She saw them in their field, they her in hers. The difficulty of seeing what stood still, like some up-ended boulder split in two, was in her clouded eyes. They saw no fear there. She seemed to think that too, thus they were safe. Then, as if there was something that, though strange, she could not trouble her mind with too long, she sighed and passed unscared along the wall. These lines cover the appearance of the doe, and she comes across as quite quizzical, quite suspicious, but not fearful, and she's thoughtful, and she comes with a sense of reassurance, and she seems to tell the humans that they are safe. So line 17 is really interesting because it creates a clear distinction between man and nature, each is staying in their place, but they can interact and learn from each other. So something really interesting as well is that the doe sees the humans as like a boulder, which is obviously something that is not alive. And I think this represents how, to her, they are not a big deal. Through looking on the other side of the wall, these people see another world in which they are insignificant. They're just something that you observe on the other side of the wall. And... Being seen as insignificant may sound like a negative thing, but I'm sure Robert Frost, with all his admiration for the hugeness of nature, would be of the opinion that it's actually quite liberating. By coming down off their human pedestal, the couple become part of something bigger. They become part of nature and feel connected to a love greater than themselves. So I think that's what these encounters with the deer teach them. This, then, is all. What more is there to ask? But no, not yet. A snort bid them to wait. A buck from round the spruce stood looking at them, across the wall as near the wall as they. This was an antlered buck of lusty nostril, not the same doe come back into her place. He viewed them quizzically with jerks of the head, as if to ask, why don't you make some motion, or give some sign of life? Because you can't. I doubt if you're as living as you look. Thus, till he had them almost feeling dared to stretch a proffering hand and a spell-breaking, then he too passed unscared along the wall. When the couple here say, what more is there to ask, there's two possible interpretations, which again go back to the two interpretations we've been talking about a little bit for the poem as a whole. 
So they could be asking for answers to their relationship problems if we go with the interpretation that they're currently encountering problems in their relationship and they might be about to break up. Or it could speak to this theme of boundaries and the couple being an example of people who stay within their boundaries. So they could be saying, what more is there to ask? Because humans are always asking why or how. We're never content with the knowledge that some things just are. But the couple sees that there's no point in questioning everything in this way and trying to break everything down. There's more point in just observing things and getting meaning out of them. So the main thing in these lines is, of course, the appearance of the buck. And we, we notice that it is more stereotypically masculine than the doe was. It has lusty nostril and a jerking head. So it has this sort of arrogance to it and it assumes about the humans and it demands that they do what he says. So obviously this talks to a lot of themes about patriarchy and dominant masculinity. Um, yeah, seems to mirror a lot of that stuff. So not not huge significance of that really, I don't think. Um, I just think that it's quite effective characterization to distinguish between the two deer. So dad is very effective in jarment and it's the closest that the humans get to crossing the wall and I think that this implies that if they did the buck would be scared and it would thus be the wrong thing to do. So this would be them overstepping their boundaries and breaking the harmonious mirroring we have going on of the two deer and the two humans. So the fact that the male deer is the one who is sort of encouraging them to break this boundary, brings to mind a parallel with other Frost poems, Home Burial and Death of a Hired Man, in how they both praise feminine values and see masculine ones as more destructive. So I think this one is slightly playing on that theme as well. Like the doe, the buck sees the couple as not alive. Again, he has a sense of mild curiosity about them, but generally just an indifference. Um, they don't hold his interest for very long. And yeah, there's a sense of indifference from each side of the wall, which I think is what allows them to coexist. So the humans are enraptured by looking at the deer, but they're not going to stay here forever. They are going to go eventually. Um, and they keep saying, oh, this must be all. So I think the spell is a metaphor for this mutual regard. That's the sort of relationship we have going on here. And if they try to interact further with each other or tamper with each other, the two sides of humans and nature will lose this respect for each other and this learning that they can get from one another by allowing each to just coexist in its own way. Am I making any sense right now? I am not sure. <laughs> two had seen two, whichever side you spoke from. This must be all. It was all. Still they stood a great wave from it going over them, as if the earth in one unlooked-for favour had made them certain earth returned their love. <gasps> I'm literally smiling reading that, that's so good. <laughs> Okay, so we have a very satisfactory conclusion here, as you can tell by my happiness. Um, the reason that it's satisfying is because we have, again, the narrative replying to the dialogue, um, but this time it agrees, finally. And I just think that's really, really effective. And those moments always stand out in the poem because they're the only bits of dialogue. And yeah, finally, we just get this where before it was disagreeing and saying, oh no, you're wrong. It's like, yeah, you're right. It's all, it's all done and it's all yay. Um, so the humans are still standing. So we get the impression that they're no longer disappointed by coming across the wall. They actually want to keep standing in front of the wall because now they're enraptured by what they're seeing. So we've taken a positive twist throughout the poem. And an interesting bit of diction here is the great wave. And I think this is a great wave of reciprocated love. And it is quite a dramatic metaphor for such a minor incident. And it's interesting that we end on this sense of certainty, even though this is just the character's interpretation. No clear facts have been presented to them. 
These deer have just come along and it could be a completely unextraordinary encounter, but they think, wow, this means that we're part of this greater love um, and our love is reflected in nature. You know, that's just their interpretation. Yet there's such a grounded sense of having come somewhere throughout the poem and this encounter having taught them something. And I think this is because this is quite a romanticist poem. It's rooted in faith, not fact. So if you just look at it from a literal perspective, you're not going to get much out of this poem. But if you think about it um, from an emotional perspective and a yeah romanticist perspective, then it's a really, really satisfying poem. So the unlooked for favour speaks to this humble individuality um, that is basically the core of romanticism. So romanticism is not about trying to explain the world or control the world. It's just about rejoicing in the individual and finding um, individual specific meaning, which is exactly what the couple do here. They're not trying to find the answer to life or anything. So it's an unlooked for favor that creates this meaning for them. So that's how I think this poem speaks to being humble and being modest. Now we're going to talk about the structure of the poem, the climax, and the circular narrative that it has. So I think the story builds from a sense of uncertainty to a sense of certainty in a romanticist narrative. So this can be shown through the language early on the poem, such as might little further up and not much further up so these are quite vague and there's a real sense of uncertainty um, but it builds up to the cu couple thinking that they were certain the earth returned their love in the end so it builds up to a certainty but a romanticist type of certainty because it is only their interpretation that they are sure of so this is a poem which is about finding meaning in your own interpretation and finding solace in the mind rather than trying to comprehend all the facts of the world and work out objectively how everything is. Then we have the couple thinking this is all which they say in dialogue twice and it is then contradicted by the narrative until the third time they say it the narrative agrees it was all. So this creates a satisfactory conclusion. We build up to a climax and then we go there, which is really, really cool to see. And another thing to notice, which I haven't mentioned yet, is that love is the last and the first line. So I think the meaning of this is to display that love is an enduring and constant force and it creates a circle. And of course, a circle has no beginning and it has no end. So that is speaking to the idea that love is enduring and goes on forever and it's the underlying theme of this whole poem. So I think this poem has a really pleasant flow in terms of narrative and structure. Um, it's just really lovely to read because there's some really great diction, some really eloquent lines and I think that through the answering of the dialogue there's just, I guess, a sense of progress. And yeah, as I said, it builds up to eventually the narrative agreeing with the dialogue. So we get to a nice, pleasant destination. Balance is also a huge part of the form of this poem. So we have lots of sort of symbols that are shown twice in the poem. So we have the doe and the buck, you know, two deer, and then there's two humans as well. We have the idea right from the title that two look at two there's an even number of people on either side of the wall many lines also repeat twice such as past unscared along the wall this is all but not so across the wall as near the wall as they we also see both the deer and the people sighing and this represents the mutuality of the encounter and i think two lines that really just embody this theme of balance in the poem is the line two had seen two whichever side you spoke from and she them in their field they her in hers which especially i really love in fact both of these have a comma in the uh, middle of the sentence which i think is called sejura in poetry that might get you a few marks in an exam if you refer to it as that 
Um, so there's, yeah, there's just two sides of each of these sentences, which again, is just another layer of this balance and this duality in this poem, which is really, really sick. <laughs> Before we move on from the form, I want to give a quick word to some of the literary devices used. So we have metaphors of the great wave of love, um, which represents love as something that's really powerful and incredible, and also the spell of mutual respect um, and interaction that the deer and the couple have, or that humans and nature have. And I think the idea of it being a spell makes it seem like they're influenced by something larger than themselves, so it's sort of the way that things have to be because it's controlled by this external force. I think it's a really cool metaphor. Then we have the enjambment of dead at the end of one of the lines, which really emphasizes just, yeah, the idea of being dead and like the temptation because you're kind of tempted to just read the next line because you want to see what they were dared to do. So that's again, really effective. We have alliteration and harsh consonants of barbed wire binding and rough it was with rock um, early on in the poem, which represent the dangers that the couple will face if they continue on this path beyond the wall, beyond their boundaries. We have the circular repetition of love as the first line and the last line of the poem. We have dialogue, which is a striking literary tool, as I've said many times, um, and is then answered by the narration. So yeah, again, I've said that many times, how effective that is as a literary tool to carry the narrative along and give this sense of interaction and reciprocation. Then there is repetition of many things. So we have repetition of lines, we have repetition of things that the deer do and then the humans do, that sort of thing. Um, and I think this speaks to the theme of, you know, there being the wall being like a mirror. Now let's delve a little bit deeper into what is probably the main theme of this poem. Uh, which is boundaries. So from what I've gathered from Robert Frost's poetry, he seems to think that man's fundamental trait is how we can never be satisfied with what we've got. But these characters show repeatedly that they are satisfied. They say, this is all, this must be all. Um, so they, they just don't expect any more than what they are given. Um, or if they are not satisfied... If they are a bit disappointed, it doesn't go beyond them sighing. They are content to make do with what they're given. An interesting line regarding this is spending what onward impulse they still had in one last look. So this acknowledges man's limitless trait um, as it is expressed in the poem There Are Roughly Zones. Um, yeah, man's limitless trait to go on, to have this onward impulse. But these characters are shown to just pretty effortlessly overcome it just through looking and it's interesting to think why they find this so easy when the characters in poems like there are roughly zones and mending wall show this just absorbing desire to go beyond and like a curiosity that it's like an itch that needs to be scratched so I'm wondering if these characters are able to overcome this because they're in love and thus this is a poem, you know, talking about how love endure endures and it's the most powerful force and it will cure all our flaws. Um, and so yeah, it could be about love and then nature gives them a helping hand in reminding them that they shouldn't go beyond the wall because uh, they get that sort of reciprocated love from the dear just by looking so it's about love but and the power of love but also the power of nature because they are shown to be unsatisfied a little bit perhaps because of their sighing uh, before the deer come along so it hints that they actually might have gone beyond the wall if it wasn't for seeing the deer so in the context of mending wall the key phrase in that poem is good fences make good neighbors and I think this poem is the embodiment of what would happen if um, the neighbours in that poem did that. Um, because these characters do obey that. They stay within their fences and they have a good interaction with their neighbours, the deer. Okay, so before I leave you, I just want to talk a little bit about another interpretation of the poem, which is that it is about a breakup, which I have... 
uh, mentioned a few times throughout the analysis, but I'm just going to put it all into one place here in case you prefer that interpretation and you would prefer to uh, center your analysis around that. So from this point of view, we see the couple when they're about to break up and we see the story of how nature encourages them to stay together. The phrase, not much further up, represents how their love is set to fail and the relationship can't go on much longer. So love and forgetting is carrying them up the path, but they can't go much further because they are doomed to fail. And they're also on a rough path, which represents how they are already having problems in their relationship. The doe sees them as two parts of a boulder that's split apart, which could represent how their relationship is falling apart. And the wall could represent the final obstacle in their relationship, the thing that they just are not able to overcome. The doe and the buck, however, are a representation of them on the other side of this obstacle. If they can overcome it, they'll become like the doe and the buck. The doe's eyes are clouded, which could represent how the woman is seeing trouble in the relationship and it's clouding her from her love. So the encounter with the doe could be interpreted as the doe essentially saying to the woman, you want to run away, you know, you're looking at all this trouble in your relationship and you want to abandon it, but you are safe because there is a sense of the doe reassuring the couple of their safety in the encounter and therefore the doe is saying you should stay to work on the relationship and in the same way the buck tells a message to the man telling him to be more proactive with their relationship and take them beyond that obstacle and therefore the couple then feel saved by nature they feel like they've got this advice and they're going to take it and they're going to overcome the obstacle and uh, save their relationship so I definitely think this is a totally valid interpretation. It seems to fit quite well. However, I personally don't conform to this interpretation just because it wasn't what I got from the poem when I first read it. I don't think they're nearing a breakup or that their relationship is in danger. Um, as I've already said, I in my interpretation, they would only be in danger of the relationship failing if they went beyond their boundaries. Um, and continue to where they must not go. So it just kind of depends if you want the focus of the poem to be on saving their relationship or if you want it to be about human nature in terms of boundaries. So I just find the boundary thing a little bit more interesting and it sort of seems to key in with other Frost poems a lot more. So that's just why I side with that interpretation. But I'd love to hear how you interpret this poem, uh, which side you side with um maybe you even have a third different interpretation let me know in the comments i hope you enjoyed this video guys see you later bye